Life Audio. Hey, friend, Heather Creekmore here. I'm glad you're listening to the Compare to Show today. Today, my guest, Dr. Amy, is going to talk about something that I have recently just been digging into, and that is this reality that our body stores and keeps trauma. Now, Dr. Amy doesn't profess to be a believer. And when we talked initially about her being on the show, her assistant said something like, just so you know, Dr. Amy approaches this from a scientific perspective. And I believe that science and the Bible were great together because God invented and created everything, including our bodies. But I just want to give you that as a heads up that Dr. Amy may not always speak about things in the way you're accustomed to things being spoken about on this show because she's not necessarily approaching it from a biblical perspective, but what she has to share about trauma, what she's found through her own research about what our bodies are doing with trauma, I think fits beautifully in with a podcast episode I did last week talking about ADHD and an episode I did a month or so ago with Elisa Keaton, where she talked about her new book in which she's talking through what do we do with the trauma stored in our bodies. So I think for those of us with body image issues, it's really important to think about about what is happening in our bodies with this trauma at the biological level. And that's where Dr. Amy goes today. So I really do think you're going to get something out of this. And it's, it's a pretty fascinating conversation. Do you need extra support on your body image journey? I tell you, it is one of the greatest honors for me to be able to walk with women through my coaching, through my brand new online course. Uh, we dig into the hard, but we get somewhere, y'all. So if you're looking for more help, go check out the Body Image Freedom Framework on the website on improvebodyimage.com. You can save $50 using the code podcast. I would love to meet you there and walk on this journey with you. Let's go. Welcome to Compare to Who, the podcast to help you make peace with your body so you can savor God's rest and feel his love. If you're tired of fighting body image the world's way, Compare to Who is the show for you. You've likely heard lots of talk about loving your body, but my goal is different. Striving to fall in love with stretch marks and cellulite is a little silly to me. Instead, I want to encourage you and remind you with the truth of scripture that you are seen, you are known, and you are loved no matter what your size or shape. Here, the pressure is off. If you're looking for real talk, biblical encouragement, and regular reminders that God loves you and you're not alone, you've come to the right place. I hope you enjoy today's show and hey, tell a friend about it. Dr. Amy, thank you so much for being on the Compared to Show today. Absolutely, Heather. I'm happy to be here. Happy for this conversation. So this concept that we carry trauma in our bodies is something that I've been kind of researching, stirring with personally, like listening to different people like you talk about over the last couple of months. And I just wanted to have you on to kind of tell what you found. I'd love for you to start by just telling us your story. Oh my goodness. Yeah, no, I, I was not planning on going into studying trauma in the body. That was not my life plan. And my life plan changed. When during medical school, I became a foster parent first and then adopted. Mm -hmm. And I was just coming out of my master's in biochemistry. I'm a science nerd, if you don't know that about me already. And I had a few months of space and I thought, ah, like, let me make my life as meaningful as possible. So let me become a foster parent, jump through all the hoops. Well, by the time that they actually had their first placement for me, I was just jumping back into third year of medical school and I get the phone call, you know, the phone call that you'll never forget. Mm -hmm. Right. Amy, we have, we have, we have one for you. And it's like, Oh, like the excitement, right? Like this has been everything that you've been working towards for months. And, and I don't know, just this idea that maybe I can make an impact on someone else's life. Mm -hmm. And they tell me about Miguel. He's four years old. He's been through a lot of homes already. And in fact, that's one of the issues is that he's got some aggression problems and other families with kids or pets don't seem to be a good fit, mm -hmm. but we think he's going to be perfect for you. And we know that with love and time, he's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. So I say yes. And they bring Miguel and I'll never, never forget that moment when I first saw him and Heather because I did not know what I know now, I started wrong. 
Mm. Not knowing that that would really set us back and how Mm. long it would take for him to ever be able to truly trust me and feel safe with me. Mm. I thought that I knew how to help him trust me and I did not. Mm. I did it all wrong. So we ended up having six long years of trying to figure it out. And in that process, Heather, he became, I mean, he, he let it all out at, at, at different points and let it all out. Meaning let, let me see the anger, the rage of all that was stored inside his body. He had been placed into the foster care system at nine months old. And obviously there were reasons why he was placed at that time. So there had already been a lot that had been happening up until that point. Mm -hmm. And he was very, very lost, very hurt, very alone, and saw me as also a threat. Mm -hmm. And it it got very scary at times. It got extremely hard, was definitely one of the hardest things that I've, that I've ever done. And it taught me so much. And that's really, that was my introduction to really understanding trauma and figuring out that all of the recommendations, the evidence-based therapies were actually not helping Mm -hmm. and some of them were making it worse. And so it put me into this place where I became so open to just learning, Mm -hmm. help me understand, let me see what else I can read. Let me see what else I can go listen to. Like what, what else can I do? I became more open than I ever thought that I would ever become Yeah. (laughs) in that process. I started to learn so much about myself and I had never been one that I had seen myself as having had trauma. And so to see, to see patterns in him that I'm like, Oh, I think I have that too. Not to that degree, Mm -hmm. but I, I think I push people away too. Mm -hmm. I think I hide my heart too. Mm -hmm. I think I'm also afraid to be seen Mm -hmm. sometimes because what if they won't like me and then they'll leave me. Yeah. And as I was learning all this about myself, just watching him and it feeling like it resonated in some place deep in me, that's when I realized that I even don't even understand the the true definition of trauma, because Mm -hmm. how could I have some of these things as well when I had a very different background in childhood than what Miguel had had. And then I got to go on my own journey. And because I was now you know, around the age of 30, my health symptoms were starting to surface from all of this stored trauma in my body. Mm -hmm. And I would have kept going and just kept pushing myself if my body had given out and said, no, we're done. Like you've, you've broken us. You've pushed us long enough. We've given you the best that we have and we're done. And for me, that was, again, the the lowest point for me in my personal health journey, Mm -hmm. and yet a very pivotal moment in shaping the rest of my life, even my career, Mm -hmm. and being able to understand then this new element that I hadn't needed to work with Miguel, because he was still a kid, right? Like Mm -hmm. the, sometimes the health issues from stored trauma take a few decades to surface. Mm -hmm. Wow. And to be able to see that and now to be faced with a new challenge of how do I work with that? Mm -hmm. And a question that I asked myself was, is it even possible to reverse Mm -hmm. these health issues that are a result of stored trauma or by now, is it too late, Heather? Mm -hmm. Uh, Am I too late? And I just have to manage. I just have to figure out, well, this is the best that I can do and I, and I'm going to need to always live with these kinds of health issues. I didn't know the answer, which was Mm -hmm. a scary place to be. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't know. And that's what I set out to find and discover. And that's what I'm able to share with people now. Yeah. And so I even have a professional training program where I share with professionals. I lead people through their journeys for this process of even connecting with our body in such a way to even know if we have stored trauma, right? Because most people don't know. Yeah. So most people think they're just stressed. They don't yeah. know that that's actually stored trauma that they're not even aware of. And it's contributing to 
all levels in their life. So when it is stored trauma, it will always present in multiple levels, everything from behaviors. And by behaviors, I refer mostly to coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Coping mechanisms are things that we do to not feel mm -hmm. uncomfortable things. Mm -hmm. And then we look at the thought level. So even the types of thoughts that we have will reflect stored trauma. We look at the emotional responses that we have that will reflect stored trauma. And then the last layer, I want to call it like the deepest layer, just because it's also deep in our body, the cellular level that will show evidence of stored trauma in our physical health symptoms. Yeah. So when I see someone with evidence in all of these areas and layers of their life, then that's when I'm saying, all right, we've, we've got to go on a journey into your nervous system, into your yeah. body where there's evidence that we have stored trauma. Yeah. Oh, I love all that. <laughs> Dr. Amy. I mean, I've, I've been listening to your show and kind of digging into this personally. So I'm, I'm geeking out on it all. Um, you said something in a show about, um, about how trauma can be, uh, not having the tummy time <laughs> as a child. And I was out in a walk listening to her. I'm like, Oh no, I've ruined my children. <laughs> like, I'm going to run home and help them right now. <laughs> but they're all teenagers. So. Get on your tummy. <laughs> Right. <laughs> They're not really into tummy time right now at <laughs> 16, but, um, we'll be right back with more right after this. I think for my crowd of women, right, we are largely women who have had eating disorders, disordered eating, some sort of food issues, but body issues. And I know my own story it's a lot more comfortable or it has been a lot more comfortable. I think for me now, I wouldn't have said it this way before, but for me to kind of live disassociated from my body, if you will, like there's my body and there's me and I've got my goals and hopefully my body will just go along. But to put it in the category of trauma, like that's really interesting. So can you kind of flesh out like, like you, your trauma was different from Miguel's. Like, what are some of these things that affect us? Like, is there a way to categorize or characterize that? Yeah. And isn't that interesting? Cause my food issues probably started when I was eight, mm -hmm. maybe earlier, maybe mm -hmm. earlier. And I didn't even know that they were food issues, right? Like, it's just something that you gravitate towards your brain finds a solution and mm -hmm it's an unconscious solution that you're not even aware of right. until you try to stop it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't until I found myself trying to, trying to stop this emotional eating and binge eating mm -hmm. that I was engaging in and realized how hard it was to stop. Mm. I even enrolled in uh, Overeaters Anonymous mm -hmm. because I, I was that desperate to have this as a solution. I, I was sure that my eating and my excess weight were the source of all the problems in my life. Mm -hmm. And so if only I could stop that, everything yeah. else would be better. And in the process, in the process, and, and, and I want to say in the process, not, not really leaning into the, the binge eating, but more my process then of trauma, realizing that I've, no, it goes deeper than the eating. Like mm. the, the eating is a solution for something. And what's, what's, what's it a solution for? And that's where I discovered all of this stuff really about a new understanding of trauma. Mm. Like what you're talking about, what are all those different things that actually can be traumas for us? And as I look back over my patterns, even in adolescence by 14, I remember starving myself for days and then binge eating for days. And there was one pattern specifically that I could look back on and see that I had. And that was that every single time I came home, doesn't matter from where Heather, mm -hmm. it could be just from outside playing. It could be mm -hmm. from down at the library. It could be riding my bike from school. It did not matter from where, but starting that early in childhood, Every time that I came home, I first, my first thing was to go to the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as I leaned into 
that during my somatic work, because I think that you know that I do a lot of mm -hmm. somatic work as part of my approach. I realized that that food was covering up feeling lonely. Mm -hmm. There was an element of, I don't feel safe here in this house. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be home. I'd mm -hmm. rather still be outside somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And then of course, with that, there comes this disguised grief because I, I don't have a home where I feel safe. Mm -hmm. And as I looked at, oh, like these, these are stored emotions that I can then understand that at that time in my life, when I was eight years old, to feel that every time I came home, and even as I say that, right, like I, I start to feel so much compassion for that young part of me, that at that time in my life, I wouldn't have been able to understand any of that. Yeah. I'm an adult now. I can have that perspective. Mm -hmm. But at that time, those feelings of, I don't want to be home and I don't even know why I don't want to be home. I just know that I don't like it here. Those feelings would have been overwhelming for me. I wouldn't have known what to do with them at that time, which mm -hmm. is why my brain and body went to the solution of, well, then let's just numb those feelings mm -hmm. for you. Yeah. And then you don't need to deal with them. Yeah. And so that's my new definition of trauma is anything mm -hmm. that for any reason at that time in our life, mm -hmm overwhelmed our ability mm -hmm. to understand and process what I'm feeling, what yeah. is happening and to know what to do with that. Mm -hmm. And so when we look back, I mean, there's all kinds of situations that we could have been through or not had and should have had mm -hmm. that would have been overwhelming for us at that time. We were so young. How could we understand that? Let alone process it. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we had a parent, maybe we had a teacher, maybe we had a friend who could help us process things. That's the protective factor. Mm -hmm. But if we didn't, or if they weren't enough mm -hmm. for helping us process all the areas of our life, we would have been left with experiences that were overwhelming at that time. Mm -hmm. And when anything is overwhelming at that time, it's almost like we tuck it into a box and we store it away. Mm -hmm. And I think we put like some type of stamp on it that says, you know, for future, for future <laughs> review, <laughs> but, but, but when is that future, right? Yeah. Like life continues to happen to us. And the more boxes that we have stored, the more that life in general starts to feel overwhelming because it takes yeah. a lot of energy to keep those boxes tucked away. Mm -hmm. And the less energy we have then for keeping up with our current life and mm -hmm. that future never comes mm -hmm. until something big happens where we feel like our life is falling apart. Or for me, my physical health fell apart. And then we're mm -hmm. faced with, Oh, I think I've got to open up some of those boxes. Mm -hmm. I'm not ready for that. I wasn't ready for that, but I don't see any other choice right now. Yeah. And then we're faced with this like big, scary task of, oh, but I don't, I don't want to, because I don't know what's in those boxes. And at that time, when I stored those boxes away, I stored them away because they were overwhelming. And so to just think about opening them, opening them, like I get overwhelmed. Yeah. Oh no, 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 that's not, that's not a good idea. No, let's, <laughs> the kitchen, the refrigerator is a much better solution, a much <laughs> yeah, better solution. Much yeah. And so I mean, the, the list is very long, Heather, of, well, what could cause us overwhelm? You know, mm -hmm. we, we joked a little bit about the tummy time, mm -hmm. but that's the real thing. Mm -hmm. If a baby, if an infant doesn't get everything that they need for their healthy development, and it's not just emotional development, it's mm -hmm. their physical development, their body will become overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And so there are things that can happen to us or again, not happen for us that should have, that we don't even remember. Yeah. We won't even have words for it because yeah. we were so young. We don't have explicit memory in our brain of that, mm -hmm. but our body holds all of that memory. It's called implicit memory mm -hmm. and it's stored in the body and it's stored in these boxes of overwhelm that mm -hmm. we've packed away. Yeah. So essentially we all have trauma. 
Yeah, <laughs> right? <laughs> and maybe like if your parent, like we're all causing trauma. <laughs> no, like how, like how do we not be overwhelmed by that? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a really good question. And from my journey, the place that I've gotten to, which what I would invite other people to do as well is I've got agreements. I have agreements. In mm-hmm. fact, I share these agreements in my foundational journey that I invite people to when they're first starting out with addressing stored trauma, because we have to do it safely. Mm-hmm. We've got to know how to open those boxes safely so we don't fall apart. And the first agreement, the first agreement that I have for myself and for that journey is that we will be present to the best degree possible Mm -hmm. and our best will be good enough for today. Mm -hmm. I can't know everything. Yeah. I can't, I can't even know everything, let alone do everything. (laughs) And especially as a parent, yeah, I'm, I'm going to commit to doing the best with the information that I have now, knowing that for whatever reason, life, God, the universe has only given me this much information Mm -hmm. thus far Mm -hmm. and I'm going to implement it. And then as I have need for more, I'm trusting in the process that more will come to me. Mm -hmm. That uh, lack of trust in the process is another sign of stored trauma Uh, where uh, I've got to control everything. Yeah. And then we go into agreement number two, which is we agree to not hold ourselves to the standard of perfectionism. Mm -hmm. And when we've moved into, no, like I need to control everything. That's what that control is. It puts us into that place of, I can't do anything wrong. I have to be perfect, especially for my kids. Cause I don't want to ruin my kids Right. and yeah. being able to say, you know what? Agreement number two, I, I do not hold myself to the standard of perfectionism. I simply start with what I can right now. Mm-hmm. And for me, those are beautiful agreements yeah. to keep coming back to every day of for whatever reason, Trauma seems to just be a part of life. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do my best to not traumatize my kids. And that still may happen. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, that seems to just be part of everyone's path in life is to experience some trauma and then have the opportunity to work with that and to work through that and to learn about themselves in the process. And in that process, experience growth, expansion. And so I... I choose not to worry about it and just do the best that I can every day. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. So your your approach is more than just talk therapy and more than just like let's, you know, let's just dig into your story and explore your story. Like your approach incorporates more, how would you say, connection with your body and then some nutritional components? Like how would you describe it? I have three essential components to my approach. And from my journey and now work with thousands of people, I've kind of come down to these three components are essential components so that if you're missing one of them, you're just not going to go as far or you Mm -hmm. may entirely get stuck. So there are three essential components. Let me start with the biology piece because that's, that's where, uh, that's kind of my, my jam And being able to see that there's this whole biology aspect of trauma. It's not just psychological. It's not Mm -hmm. just in our head, which is why we can't just talk about it. Mm -hmm. It's also not just emotional. It is also biology. And so Mm -hmm. just going back to our tummy time, since we brought that up now, some (laughs) a couple of times, you need to, you need to go back and change those patterns, Mm -hmm. right? Like if, if you, if you don't, you're going to be fighting your own biology in the process of trying to heal trauma. Mm -hmm. And what we can do when we bring in the biology piece is we can actually support the body and the biology so that it helps us in our trauma work Mm -hmm. and not something that we are fighting against. And the older that you are, the more that the biology piece is important Mm -hmm. because my experience versus Miguel's experience, he had, you know, a four-year-old body. Mm -hmm. I had a 34 year old body. (laughs) So there's, there's decades of accumulated effects of trauma on the biology. And that has to, has to be part of our working approach for the Mm -hmm. best success. The biology piece will not be enough though, because you Mm -hmm. can't out supplement trauma. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You can't out sleep trauma. (laughs) You can work on your best sleep. You can work on your best anything. Mm -hmm. And 
you can't you can't out biology anything trauma. So we have to bring in these other components. The essential, the two other essential components are some type of what I call somatic work. And somatic work, it starts with connecting with the body, Heather, but it's not just connecting with the body because I can connect with my body, but then what do I do with that? Mm -hmm. What do I do with that connection? So it's, it's connecting in a way that I can actually understand and hear the messages from my Mm -hmm. body and I can respond to those messages so that it becomes a dialogue, mm-hmm. not just a connection. Mm-hmm. And in that dialogue, Heather, what ends up happening is that people start to hear what their body is telling them that it needs in order to safely open up a box and mm-hmm. process what's in it and resolve it and discharge it. Mm-hmm. Until we hear those messages and can respond we don't give our body what it needs. And that's why we just continue to accumulate more and more stored boxes. Mm -hmm. So in this process, it is safe for a person to be able to process a lot of their own traumas, even on their own. They don't Mm -hmm. need the therapist for that. Mm -hmm. It's just, they haven't known how to connect, listen, Mm -hmm. understand, and respond to what their body is saying. But once I teach them how to do that, they start, they start processing a lot of stuff in a safe way because they're now, I want to use this word attuned, right? Mm-hmm. Just like a parent is attuned to their child. I am attuned to my body yeah. and giving it what it is asking for in the moment when it is asking for it. Yeah. Changes everything. And then the other essential component is some type of parts work. People may be familiar or may not be familiar with this idea of internal family systems Mm -hmm. and that we have different parts of us. So for example, I had a part of me that would feel lonely when I came home, when I was a kid, that was one part of me. And then I had a different part of me that would say, oh, let me help you with that lonely part. Mm -hmm. I am the part that goes to the kitchen for food Mm -hmm. and So we have these different parts of us and we have to work with those parts if we're going to change the patterns Mm -hmm. that those parts play out in our life. Otherwise we can understand what we do and even why we do it, but we're still not able to change it Mm -hmm. until we actually learn how to work with these parts, communicate with these parts. And there's a whole process of like negotiating and Mm -hmm. coming coming to a place where we can support them for what they need rather than, again, trying to um, out willpower them because that's (laughs) never going to work with our parts. So those are the three essential components. And there are, you know, different things you can say, well, where does yoga fit in with that? Where does EMDR fit in with that? Where does, you'll notice that not, you know, like talk therapy was not one of my essential components. Mm -hmm. Um, So there, there are different ways in which different things can fit in under one of those categories, but those are the three essential categories and all of the pieces that then I now bring into my approach and lead people through for their healing journey to safely, safely open up and start to heal stored trauma. Well, I think the concept of attunement really goes right in line with a lot of what we talk about on this show in terms of healing our relationship with food, because most people that have been on a, you know, on a diet since they were nine years old, (laughs) like myself, you know, just even basic body cues, like hunger, (laughs) you know, we've been taught to ignore those, right? Like you're not hungry. Like you can, you know, it's seven o'clock. We don't eat after seven. So we're not hungry after seven and you're laying in bed at 10 o'clock. I'm so hungry, but no, I'm not hungry. You know, ignore that. So, I mean, that's, that's like, just kind of right in line with that. I remember you saying something on one of the shows that I heard you on, about running. Do you remember what it was? It was something about like how some of like how we want to over-exercise and there was some reason for that. Does that ring any bells to you? I should have written it down. There's lots of reasons for that. So over-exercising is a, I mean, it's a very effective solution for a lot of problems. (laughs) Uh, And I, and I say problems in quotations, right? So (laughs) running for one thing can give us dopamine. Mm -hmm. And for people who are low in dopamine, they will need something to give them dopamine. Eating will give us dopamine. Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to not eat, well, then 
you may find yourself moving to exercise and running for that. So for people who are what we call under methylators, they have a methylation imbalance. This is not just yeah. MTHFR. This is actually yeah. more than that. <laughs> but for the, for those who are an under methylator, most of them have lower activity in serotonin and dopamine. Mm -hmm. And this is an epigenetic condition, not genetic, epigenetic condition that you're born with. Mm -hmm. Often related to how much folate your mother took while she was pregnant, by the way. Mm -hmm. So Interesting. speaking of biology, right? Like all, <laughs> yeah. all these biology things start to come into play. But if you if you are an infant and you have lower serotonin and dopamine, you are going to need more from your mother for mm. just feeling safe in your body. Mm. And it may be more than what she can provide because mm. you need more. Mm. And when that happens, we will come out of our childhood feeling insecure. Mm. And it may have not as much to do with our parents, though it may, because that mm. could have been part of the equation. It could have just been our biology that just, we were not as available because dopamine mm. is one of those neurotransmitters that is key to bonding and feeling attached and feeling secure. So if we yeah. don't have that, yeah. Ooh, like we're, we're coming out and Again, there we have a very uncomfortable sensation where I don't even feel safe in the world now. Mm -hmm. I walk around constantly feeling like, okay, what else is going to go wrong? What else is going to go wrong? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> when is it going to happen? When is yeah. it going to go wrong? I know that something's going to go wrong. Mm -hmm. And and so there's it just kind of starts to develop a lot of uncomfortable sensations, overwhelming mm -hmm. sensations for sure. And so we start looking for solutions and running, exercise can be a solution for that. Um, I mean, I'm thinking of, of not only myself, I'm thinking of a number of other people, um, especially in childhood, right? Like the boys tend to go to weightlifting. Some mm -hmm. of them, some of them go to running mm -hmm. depends on, depends on, again, their brain will probably try both and then say, ah, this, this one helps us numb those feelings better. And for me, it's usually seen that they feel abandoned feel emotionally abandoned by a parent that's important to them mm -hmm. and to not feel that they go to exercise. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Oh, so I have like 27 more questions based on that conversation, <laughs> but actually let me, let me just throw one out to you. I don't, and I don't, I don't know if it's going to go anywhere, but I had someone else on the show talking about ADHD and we're kind of having similar conversations about dopamine and serotonin. And like, is there a, is there a kind of connection you see in there too? Huge. Yeah. yeah. So ADHD is really all trauma. Mm. And, and I, and I use that word again, my definition of trauma, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that ADHD is caused by a big bad event in your life. I'm saying that ADHD is a trauma pattern mm -hmm. of the body. Mm -hmm. where the nervous system is in a dysregulated state, mm -hmm. meaning it can't focus on the present moment because I feel like there's danger. And I don't, yeah. I don't know, like, what was that sound? What is that? What is that? Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's not able to say, no, I'm, I'm safe. Yeah. All, all is well. And this is what I want to spend my focus on and mm -hmm. let me focus on that. And so all ADHD the root of it is a nervous system in dysregulation. That's mm -hmm. what I call a biology of trauma. Mm -hmm. And so the same approach applies, which is beautiful, which is beautiful because then we have our clear path forward of, okay, I'm going to need to work with my body in a somatic way. I'm going to yeah. need to work with the parts of me. I'm yeah. going to need to work with the biology. And that's how we bring in that health and regulation for the nervous system which then will take away all of the symptoms that are a result of that dysregulated nervous system. Yeah. Wow. That's good. That's so helpful. Well, Amy, thanks yeah, for being you. on the show today. Appreciate you so much. Can you tell everyone where they can connect with you? Yeah. Thank you, Heather. They can find me at biologyoftrauma.com and traumahealingaccelerated.com, whichever one, biologyoftrauma.com or traumahealingaccelerated.com. And uh, yeah. Start, I have some free guides there for them. In fact, if they go to traumahealingaccelerator.com, I have a guide there that has a quiz inside. And that guide is called the steps to identify and heal stored trauma. 
And that way they can even start to know if they also may have some stored trauma. Sounds good. I'll put all the links in show notes so everyone can connect with you. Well, thanks again, Amy. Appreciate you being on the show today. Thank you, Heather. Okay, take care. And thank you for watching or listening. I hope something today has helped you stop comparing and start living. Bye-bye. The Compared You Show is proud to be part of the Life Audio Podcast Network.